In the last video, we saw how to assign absolute configurations to carvone. We saw that R carvone smells like spearmint, and S carvone smells like caraway. And I actually made some spearmint this week, uh, some R carvone from limonene. So you can actually convert the smell of oranges to the smell of spearmint. So that's a very cool experiment. I, I highly encourage you to do it if you get the chance. So it turns out that R carvone and S carvone are optically active. So they are they are enantiomers of each other and they have different smells but they have the exact same melting points and boiling points. So if we check out the melting point of R carvone, right? It's 25 and S carbone also has 25 boiling point is 231 versus 231 and and this makes sense if you think about it because these physical properties are due to intermolecular forces and R carbone and S carbone are going to have the same intermolecular forces they would just be mirror images of how everything interacts so we would expect those those values to be the same uh, besides the difference in smell, these, these two compounds actually have different optical activity. They will behave differently when exposed to what's called plain polarized light. So let's, let's look at a little diagram to help us understand how these molecules will interact with plain polarized light. So here I have a what's called a polarimeter. So this is a polarimeter right here, which is just a tube. All right, and into the polarimeter, we're going to put a solution of our enantiomer. So if we chose one of those enantiomers uh, for carbon, and we dissolved it in, in a solvent, and, and we put it into this tube, and so there would be, there would be some, some molecules floating around inside of this tube like that. Now, uh, we're going to need a light source. So over here on the left, we have a light source. So I'm going to draw the, the unpolarized light that is produced from a light source. So that is unpolarized light. And usually the light source that's used is a sodium lamp. So this is uh, over here, this, this light would come from a sodium lamp, which emits light at a wavelength equal to 589 nanometers. And this is called the D line of sodium. So this is the, the D line of sodium. When this unpolarized light hits a polarizing filter, so this is a polarizing filter right here, and a polarizing filter will have will have lines that only allow certain kinds of light to go through. So if this unpolarized light travels toward the polarizing filter, only only the vertical, only this vertical plane of light can get through the polarizing filter. So out of all these unpolarized, only this one's going to get through. So let me go ahead and label this as my as my polarizing filter. And now we have a plane of polarized light. That plane of polarized light is going to go towards the tube here. And when that plane of unpolarized light, I'm trying to draw it uh, straight up and straight down, hits, hits the molecule dissolved in the tube here, it's actually going to rotate as a result of interaction with those particles. So let's see if, I can, if you can see that that plane of light is actually rotating as it hits that particle. And as it exits that, that tube, let's say, it's, let's say it's still pretty much in that direction. So the plane of polarized light has rotated due to interaction with the three-dimensional molecule, one of, one, of the, one of the enantiomers of carbon. So when it exits out the tube here, it's, it's then going to go to the analyzer. So this is the analyzer here. And the analyzer is similar to the filter in that you can, uh, you, you can make it so that it only allows one type of plane polarized light through. And if you wanted to let this plane of polarized light through, this one that's one that exited our polarimeter here, like that, you would have to rotate your analyzer in order to allow that plane of light through. So you'd have to rotate your analyzer this way. So it's the exact same angle. So now, now your plane of polarized light can 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 get, go to your analyzer like that. And obviously, it has rotated. When we first when we first had that plane of polarized light, it was straight up and down, right? So it's it's rotated an angle. It's oh, it's rotated an angle this way. So we're going to call that angle the observed rotation, which is symbolized by alpha. So this is the observed rotation. Let's uh let's go ahead and redraw that picture so we can see a little bit better. We started off with a plane of polarized light straight up and straight down, and after that plane of polarized light hit our chiral compound, 
it rotated to the right, and obviously that makes an angle between 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 my two planes there. So here's an angle, <clears throat> which we call alpha, which is our observed rotation. So alpha is called the observed rotation. And since um, since our plane of polarized light was rotated to the right, so it went it went this way. <clears throat> that's clockwise. So we call a clockwise rotation of light. We say we say that's a positive rotation. So this is positive here. So over here on the analyzer, if 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 the uh, if the plane is rotated to the right, we call that clockwise. And we, and we call that a positive rotation. Also, you'll hear the term uh, dextrorotary. So this is a this is a dextrorotary rotation of polarized light. Now, what would happen if the plane of polarized light had rotated to the left? So it it went through the tube there, and this time the analyzer. This time you have to actually rotate it to the left to allow that plane to pass through. So let's draw that over here. Well, we would start vertically again, and this time this time it came out to this side, and so or my observed rotation would be going would be going to the left this time. So the the plane is rotated to the left. We call this a negative rotation, so we get a negative sign. Uh, it's going counterclockwise, and also you could call it levorotary. So levorotary and dextrorotary come from Latin terms for to the left and, and, and to the right, depending on how you're rotating your plane of polarized light. So the alpha is the observed rotation, and it, it makes sense that uh, alpha will be dependent upon how many molecules it hits, right? So if you if you doubled the concentration in your tube, right, if you increase the number of molecules in there, the plane of polarized light is going to hit more and more of those molecules, and it's going to rotate even more. So the if you double the concentration, you actually double the observed rotation. The same idea holds true with the length. So if I think about if I think about the length of this tube, right, so I, I can change it based on concentration, which would be C, and I could also change how how the how the observed rotation occurs by changing the length. If I made this tube longer, well then the plane of polarized light would hit more molecules and therefore it would cause more of a rotation. So if you double the length of your tube, you're also going to you're also or called the path length, so L is the path length, you're also going to double your observed rotation. So we can kind of combine these 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 things into an equation. So let's look at the equation for observed rotation just to standardize everything. So my observed rotation, which is alpha, is affected by the concentration, which is C, and, and then the path length, which is L. So C times L, or the, or, or the length of the two. This is going to be equal to what's called the specific rotation. So we put alpha in brackets, and now we can label this as being the specific rotation. So the specific rotation is a physical constant. So specific rotation, a physical constant like it's like it's boiling point. So it's it's unique to each optically active compound, and we can we we we, we can standardize our conditions for concentration and path length, and that way we can compare the rotations of different compounds and and see how they compare in terms of how they rotate plane polarized light in terms of their optical activity. So the standard conditions are to make the concentration. Standard concentration would be one gram per milliliter, and the path length would be one decimeter. One decimeter. So one decimeter is equal to ten centimeters, just to give you an idea. So this this allows us to calculate specific rotations for many many different compounds. The these the uh, the specific rotations are also sensitive to things like the temperature and the wavelength. Right, if you change the temperature, obviously you, you can affect how things rotate. And if you change the wavelength of the light, you can also change that as well. So we can also specify the specific rotation in terms of the temperature in degrees Celsius. So you put that as like a superscript. And then the wavelength of light, which would be in nanometers. So this is, this is yet another way to, to specify your, your specific rotation for different compounds. Let's go and look at the two original molecules that we talked about, R-carbone and S-carbone. So if you took R-carbone, a pure sample of R-carbone, and you put it into 
in, in, into a, a polarimeter and you measured the specific rotation, you would get that the specific rotation of R carbon, so the specific rotation of R carbon um, at 20 degrees, so room temperature, and the wavelength would be the D line of sodium. Uh, this is equal to negative 61 degrees. So R carbon will will rotate light. Uh, will will rotate light to the left. S carbon, it turns out, will give you a specific rotation of positive 61 degrees. So this will actually rotate it to the right. So this is this is interesting. We can we can rewrite R carbon and S carbon up here. We can say that this is uh, R carbon. So it's we know it's R, but it rotates light. To, uh, to the left, so we can put a negative sign in here as well. So you could go like that. And for S carbon, we know that it was S, we learned that in the last video, it rotates right to the right, which is what gave us our positive sign. So you can use, you can use a positive sign to designate this enantiomer, or you could use an S. And there is no correlation between R and S and negative and positive. Sometimes students think there is and, and there is not. So, so they're, they're two very different things. The negative and the positive sign tell you which way these molecules rotate plane polarized light. The R and the S are completely different, so there's no connection between the two. The first person to discover this concept that enantiomers will give you specific rotations equal in magnitude but opposite in sign of rotation, the person who did this was Louis Pasteur, so obviously a very famous scientist. And he made several contributions to the field of stereochemistry, and he, he crystallized some tartrate salts, and he noticed that the crystals were, were mirror images of each other. So he sat there and he picked them out with tweezers and then he dissolved them in water and found their specific rotations. And he found when he used pure solutions of the enantiomers, he got one optical rotation. The other enantiomer gave him the exact opposite uh, in, in sign, but equal in magnitude. So he was the first one to discover this. And he was also the first one to discover when you take a 50% mixture of R and a 50% mixture of S, you will get an optical rotation of zero. So let's let's write let's write down what that would be. So if you have a 50% mixture of R and a 50% mixture of S, an exactly equal amount of enantiomers, your optical rotation will be equal to zero because when the plane of polarized light hits one of the molecules. It, it would rotate one way, and then the odds are it will come in contact with another molecule, the enantiomer, which will rotate the opposite way. And so those two rotations would cancel each other out and give you an optically inactive mixture. So this is called a, a, uh, a racemic mixture. So let's go ahead and write that. A, a racemic mixture is a 50% mixture of enantiomers, an exact half and half mixture. And you'll see there are a lot of chemical reactions that we'll study in the future that will produce a, a racemic mixture. So in the next video, we'll look at a few more calculations involving optically active compounds.